All right. Well, today's uh, talk is when, when it gets posted is going to be called the Rite of Spring. And uh, one thing I'm trying to emphasize this year, as it was we started with uh, before Christmas with Advent, was this is where the liturgical calendar starts, where the sacred time starts for the year. Uh, we're starting a thing called Lent. And there's there's other traditions that start about this time too. There's something going on out there. Uh, when I sit outside or walk on the roads now, it's noisy. It's more like Santana than Debussy right now. <laughs> the uh, the frogs even started their little reggae music the other night, and so it's the energy is building. And so it's always it's interesting uh, this time of the year and how um, and and what it's for. So I want to really we've got we've got five weeks left. Uh, Lent technically starts this ritual period of forty days started uh, Wednesday and Ash Wednesday. And uh, so I wanted to sort of tune you into it and, and then we can go along and, and every day is, is, is a practice day as far as I'm concerned, just a practice of becoming more and more alive. But uh, this is a kind of special thing where all over the world people are doing it. Ramadan starts next month. That's a different kind of practice time, but people who try to tune human beings into the other dimension of there's a horizontal dimension of clock time, which we have to deal with, you know, we started about 11 o'clock, that's really useful. Uh, but then there's a vertical dimension that is about sacred time. It's about sacred time, it's a circular, comes around. You know, this is about 70 years for me coming around uh, to, to Lent, to spring. Lent means spring, which would have, would have surprised me as a young uh, Catholic schoolboy because Lent seemed, I thought it was for a couple of years, I thought it was Lent, like drier Lent, because it was a very gray time, you know, and everybody, everything was shutting down where it's real interesting and everything out there is opening up sort of. It's meant to time with spring because it's, it's meant to get you ready for this um, eternal spring that uh, some call resurrection. But one of my good friends and longtime uh, fellow pilgrim. Uh, she, she just, she's many times said, I just don't get this resurrection thing. And, uh, and so we were, I want to go into this resurrection thing here because <laughs> we're trying to get, it's something you prepare for every day for this resurrection thing. So here's, here's the poem of the day. I can pull it up here. It's just called the rite of spring. The ancients called the sacred ritual time of prepar preparing for resur resurrection, the ancients called the sacred ritual time of preparing for resurrection, Lent. That means spring. Just as Advent was a sacred ritual time to prepare for the uh, birth of, uh, of Jesus, uh, oops, I lost it there. Yeah, sorry about that. Just as Advent was a sacred ritual time we worked with this year to prepare for the birth of Jesus. Lent is a sacred ritual time to prepare for the birth of the Christ. The Christ. Christ was not Jesus's last name. It's what he became. I did as a, again, all the you know, we, we grow in our understanding of what this whole ball game is about, the whole shebang is about. And in the beginning, I really had grown up uh, Catholic family, uh, Italian Catholic family. I thought Christ was his last name, perhaps was shortened when he entered the United States from Cristofo or whatever it was. I didn't know, you know, nobody really talked to me about it, but Lent, uh, you know, it's, it's, Christ was not Jesus's last name. Actually, Jesus was not Jesus's first name as we'll, uh, we'll approach when we go to the uh, Dancing with Spirit in a couple of weeks, uh, it was called Yeshua. So it's interesting that this guy that has moved so many people for so long uh, towards resurrection themselves, 
He never heard the word Jesus and he never heard the, the word Christ. Those are both Greek terms that came much later, you say. Uh, so this is, this is really a time of, of under, trying to understand the birth of this uh, Christ. Jesus died on the cross and then boom, a few days later, the Christ, you know, he was his last name. It was not his last name, it's what he became. And Christ is what any of us could become if we want to. If we consent to doing 40 days of spring cleaning, that's what I like to think of Lent now as 40 days of spring cleaning to prepare our soul, prepare our soul for its resurrection. What would that be like? Well, really, what would it be like, you know, to, to have the resurrection of your own soul? I have the resurrection of my soul. What would that be like? Uh, well, when the face of our soul and the face we show the world is one and the same. That's that's an image that uh, makes sense to me. It's when the face of, of your own soul and the face of the, the face that you show the world is the same face. We have this ritual thing about doing this. The two become one. And uh, you know, uh, that, that's an image of what it really, what your resurrection would mean, at least from my point of view. Well, in the face of your soul and the face uh, you show the world is one and the same. And this, the, for the ancients, 40 was a symbol for either a lifetime or as long as it takes. Yeah, let's uh, let's dwell on uh, uh, abide with this poem a little bit and sort of open it up just a little bit. Uh, just the uh, the idea, and if you know, uh, if if you're a Richard Graham fan, he's got a a book on what he calls the Cosmic Christ, and uh, Ilya Delio, a, a great uh, Franciscan nun. Terror shared on before the two of them. He talked about Christ as an, a, a sort of an evolutionary omega point that we're all heading towards, you see. That all of creation is heading toward this thing called the Christ. It wasn't it just, just a guy, a very special guy, 2000 some years ago. and. Uh, so we put him on a pedestal and, you know, think he was really cool. No, he was, he was uh, an avatar or a representative or a, a kind of pioneer saying, you know, Jesus never said, hey, believe in me. He just said, I'm the way. So he's sort of like, was like Daniel Boone finding the way to Kentucky. You know, he heard about it. He thought there's gotta be something beyond the mountains, Boone did, but well, when he finally found it and could go back to North Carolina with the map. See, he was a trailblazer. He was a trailblazer. I see Buddha and Jesus in the, the many people, Merton, the, the Dalai Lama, these people are they're trailblazers and they're not saying, hey, I'm not that special. I'm just, it's just they're leaving maps, you see. It's, it's hard to make the journey without a map. And so they're leaving maps. And uh, Christ was, and Jesus was, Yeshua was that kind of a person. Um, but the Christ is for everybody. Even, you know, non-Christians, it doesn't make any difference. Tiara didn't say that, you know, only Christians are going to make this omega point of, of it, it was total kind of evolution of consciousness. And we've talked about that. Uh, that's a, a stream from the very beginning. We've been talking about how we have these, these, these sort of three-tiered kind of consciousness. You know, it comes in threes. And, uh, you know, the childhood operating system, you know, pretty good from one to six. And then there's a few helpful things that you can upload into the strategic operating system, reason, you know. Uh, and those two together is really those two operating systems will get you to a kind of mental egoic life. You know, the ego is not all bad, despite what 
some spiritual people say ego can be uh, your ego self can the ego can be a very helpful tool extremely helpful you all showed up here somebody invented zoom so we could show up here so uh the the ego is it's a tr extremely a helpful tool but it's um it's it's not a sufficient identity it's really not a really good identity there's a difference between a tool and who you are you see and so the identity lies when you can up upload or download in the direction of, that I always talk about to download into the, the third deepest form of consciousness, which is called by many contemplative traditions, the heart. So here we are heart to heart. We're using words because that's they're helpful, but the words point to it. They're not it. You see, you can walk around chanting contemplation, meditation, contemplation, and you would chant it all day, but it ain't it. The words point to it, though, you see, and so we, we want to look at that. Uh, it's 40 days. Now, <clears throat> the Buddha did the same thing. The Buddha went out to the, to the, uh, he, when he realized he had to, he had to leave the palace mentality, you know, he left the imperial mentality because he realized that it was not the, not the whole picture. And so he went out into the forest for, uh, six years into the jungle. Okay, so this is this time of, of of going away from the cultural view. In his case, in the palace, you know, they say he didn't know that anybody ever got old, and they were keeping away old people. They were keeping away sick people. He never knew people got sick, and he never knew people died. That's you know, that's the story. You know, it's symbolic, but you know, it's the world of a child. Really, you don't know anything that deep. But when he saw that, he just got off the got out of the, went on a, like a kind of little tour and he saw all these things. And then finally, when he saw somebody dead, he said, this happens to princes too? Oh yeah. That just blew his whole imperial mindset. And he left up, he said, I've got to go off. So he goes into the, away from the seat of power into the jungle and sits to tr and just said, I'm going to sit down. He tries a bunch of, uh, various forms of meditation, because they were around. There are forest dwellers there. Uh, he's, he's got another story, but he had, to, he had to leave the seat of power to lead the cultural view of what life was all about. And he found something. He woke up. That's his name. You know, Buddha, the guy who woke up. Yeah. You know, he wasn't interested in going to Florida. Let's put it that way, you know. If you're not interested in waking up, gee, I don't know why you're here. Wait, that waking up is the metaphor for resurrection. Something inside you wakes up and you, you, you it's like you, you come out of the dream world about what life is. Days go by, weeks go by, months go by, decades go by. And then uh, I've, I've worked with people. I've had the experience myself. Like when I work with people, I said, I don't know what I was doing in my in my 20s and 30s and 40s, I really have no memory of that. It was like I was asleep. It was like I was in a dreamscape. And, uh, but now I'm awake. That's resurrection, you see, waking up. Uh, how they can turn being awakened or woke into something that's dangerous just proves we can do anything with words. <laughs> Hopefully we'll do something better today. Now, Jesus did the same thing. Uh, Matthew, uh, only the Gospel of Mark. We're reading Matthew now in the the thing. Uh, in the today, they'll be reading a section from Matthew. Now, but Jesus was for his whole life. He left Nazareth. He was looking for something. He was looking for something, looking for something. And then he goes, gets baptized in the Jordan, and he finds what he's looking for. Uh, kind of Spielberg moment, and this, this dove says, "Hey, you're my son, and I love you." You love them. That's that's the whole enneagram in a nutshell. Nine or or you know variation of nine million ways you can hustle to feel worthy enough to be loved. You see, when you find your enneagram number, you sort of find out what your little hustle dance is to where you feel worthy enough to be loved. We're all doing that, okay? And uh, so Jesus, he heard what he he heard what he. Uh, what he'd been waiting for. You're worthy of love. I love you. But then uh, 
he gets, and he's already in the desert. So he's miles from the uh, worlds away from Jerusalem where the center of power was. But the, the Holy Spirit says, go out further. So he goes into the desert deeper and he spends 40 days there. That's what they'll be talking about if you're if you're at the, the church here in town or any Catholic church and Protestant churches too. They'd be reading from the lecture and they talk about, they're reading from Matthew. He goes out to the desert, spends 40 days. And then, uh, you know, fasting. In other words, fasting from all the noise in Nazareth, all the fanfare in Jerusalem, you know, all the Roman legionnaires, he's leaving all that. And uh, so he's listening. That's about the only thing you can do in the desert. You can't even, you know, well, fasting's not such a big deal because there's not much to eat, you see. But you you listen in the desert. So he's listening. And then the devil shows up. We all, if you don't know what that is, just, you know, we're going to be meditating in a few minutes. <laughs> those voices, you know, those voices. Well, the devil shows up and he says, Oh wow! He says you're, you're pretty, you know you're out here for forty days. You 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 know you're you're pretty great. I, I I I bet you know you must be hungry though. So can you turn this stone here into into bread? You know, challenging him to be a miracle worker. And he says, and you know, Jesus said, no, no. You know, these the, these are these are symbolic things. Buddha had five of them, by the way. Uh, Jesus had three. So the uh, the church, the son, everybody said, no, no. And he says, you know, man lives by more than bread alone, you know, and then uh, takes him up to a high place. And he says, uh, all right, you can see the whole world, Jerusalem and everything. He said, if, if, if you just bow down and serve me, you can have all this. You can control all this. And Jesus said, yeah, yeah, don't, don't tempt me. Don't tempt me. You know, and he, he just turns that down. And then he goes in one of the gospels. Anyway, it's the gospel of Luke, actually not Matthew. The gospel of Luke has this order. The, the last two temptations are switched in the gospels, but he says, oh, okay. Well, you really are something. He said, I bet if you, and then he, he gets transported to the, right to the center of power is on the top of the, the, of the temple in Jerusalem. And he said, you really are something. I said, I bet if you throw yourself down here from the, that angels will catch you. And then everybody know what a, will know what a big deal you are. And he, he doesn't go for it. Now, those three temptations are symbolic. And anybody who's spent any time with the Enneagram, those are the three temptations, though, for which if you, if you go for them, that's, that's the childhood operating system. You could, you know, we're fixated on survival and security, bread. And then power and control, okay, and then affection and esteem. And those that's what we need to get through childhood. You gotta have an adequate amount of those. And any of us or any any of children worldwide that has doesn't get an adequate amount of safety and security, doesn't get an ad, you know, nourishment, doesn't get an adequate amount of some affection, and doesn't get an adequate amount of to develop some some sense of power and control empowerment and control if you don't get an adequate amount at any either of those stations that's traumatic and that you're that sort of resonates with you people who live in a, a very poor existence or really just on the margins well that's traumatic for little kids and uh, uh and for people maslow says you can't do much on the spiritual journey if you don't have basic survival and security and then if the affection of esteem and the beginning it's your mother, it's your father, brothers and sisters, how do they look at you? So see, Jesus is facing these things. These are things you could sell your, your soul's journey out for. They can, uh, they can, they are the pattern of the veils and all three of them, I have all three of them, you know, that get in the way. Survival and security, affection and esteem, power and control. But I know power and control is the big thing for me. And when that's frustrated, when I'm out of control, you know, you know, if you're if you're coming from the eight and nine and one thing, that's the big button. When you're out of control, and what you'll do for control and for power, you're seeing it. Putin's an eight on the enneagram. What he would do, how many lives would be shed for him to feel like he was in control? You know, I understand. He's he's my brother, my dark brother on the other side of the, the enneagram. 
Uh, what you do for power and control? Would you sell your soul for affection and esteem? You know, if you're a two, three, or four, you've done it a lot. I've done it plenty. You sell your true self out to get people to smile at you, to like this version of yourself, you see? And then, you know, basic, you know, if you're, you're five, six, and seven, that just means your, your basic thing is, you know, security, Financial. I mean, why do these guys have to have hundreds of billions of dollars? There's no, there's no way you can even spend a billion dollars. You got to really work at it. You got to build rockets and stuff. But a hundreds of billions of dollars. These are people who have trauma in the survival security thing. Uh, so, so this is essential for us. And so, how, how this leads us uh, into like a special practice period of uh, the next five weeks is to, um, here's the question. This is the question for the next five weeks that, you know, it doesn't have an answer like your normal questions, but it, it's, it opens things up. The question is, um, what's getting in the way of me being more loving and my life being more alive? Things get in the way, and uh, and there there are these um, you know uh, habits we have, these sort of addictions we have for security, affection, and esteem, power and control. And again, an inordinate amount of it becomes an addiction. An adequate about amount of it is what all human beings need. But how much security do you need? How much, you know? I lean way into the two. And so for a long time, as a young teacher, decade probably at least, I would prepare and teach a great class. And if one student didn't like it, you know, it was all or nothing. You had to please all the people all the time. You know, that's that whole right side of the Enneagram sort of buys into that. You know, if you don't please all the people all the time, you failed, you see. Yeah. Yeah. So these things get in the way. And then the emotions come. And then, you know, it, it, it covers the, you know, it covers your true self up with tangles, tangling veils. And Jesus said, why are you putting your light under a bushel basket? It's the same image of obscuring the light that you have in there. Because at your very center is the lie and so how do you let it out see so this question like what's really getting in the way uh what's really getting in the way of me being more alive and and, and actually both giving and receiving more love and being saner too you know until our love becomes bigger than the insanity out there you know, and you know, it loves loves a personal thing. You know, you you let you lend your light to the world when to when our, until our light becomes uh, bigger than this darkness and insanity that's up there. It, it's it's going to be insane. So we have a we have this kind of role to do. So this is a good training period. It's a good training period. So. Uh, so meditating on those, uh, that idea when we sit of just, you're not thinking about it so much, but just, just sitting with the talk and then just things may occur to you like, oh yeah, I talked to, to somebody recently and they, about this and they sort of came up with what they're going to work on for, uh, for Lent. And it's not like a self-improvement thing. Because there's nothing that can improve on your, your 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 true self, your soul. It's a kind of uh, self unveiling thing you see, and you say, "All right, I'm going to stop doing that because this gets in the way of life and love for me." See, that's a very interesting way to do it. You know, giving up chocolate for Lent, like they taught us as little kids, like, as if the world was going to be changed by this. And you know, 
as soon as you get Lent was over, you gorged yourself with all the chocolate, you know, or you ate chocolate during Lent and felt guilty, so you were worse off for it. You know, this is not that kind of deal. It's not self-improvement. It's not penance because you're so miserable or anything. No, it's like trying to unveil. You're trying to open up. And it'll come to you if, if you sit in contemplation uh, uh, on a daily basis. That's one thing that could just, just uh, elevate the whole thing is if you don't sit every day, if you don't spend time in silence every day, uh, try to be more regular. And if you do, you know, sit a little bit more, maybe. That's what I did at the retreat. We just, we just sat, 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 and then the rest of the time we were in silence and things came that I could not see. I, I mean, I have a very regular practice, but when you do an intensive, that's why I do one a month for you guys, give you a chance to sit more, get more silence for longer. Things will come that you can't get in the ordinary. So, all right, well, I think that's good. I think that's good for the talk.